Well, thank you for joining with us again today. And we trust that God will bless us as we spend this time together. We're continuing our studies in the Gospel of Luke. And today we'll be in the, the first part of chapter three. Uh, but before we start looking at the scriptures, let's have a brief word of prayer together. Our God and our Father, we come to thee today in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we thank thee again, our Father, for this opportunity that we have of looking into the word of truth. And we thank thee, Father, for the scriptures. We thank thee, Father, uh, for what they contain. We thank thee, Father, for their relevance to us. And we just pray, Father, that thou wilt speak to us again today through the pages of thy word. Give help uh, by thy spirit, our Father, we pray. Grant an understanding of the things that we hear and the things that we read together. We commit our time into thy hands as we give thee thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So let's read the scriptures together. <clears throat> We're reading in Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, and we'll read the first 18 verses. <clears throat> Luke's Gospel, and chapter 3, and verse 1. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Ichiria, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers! Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none, and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans, or tax collectors, to be baptised, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? <clears throat> and he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptise you with water, but one mightier than I cometh the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptise you with the, Holy, with the Holy Ghost, with the Holy Spirit, and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. And once again we look to God to add his blessing to the reading of his precious word today. <clears throat> now the passage that we've read uh, can be divided into a number of segments and we'll look at it that way today. In verses 1 and 2 we have the setting for the events that are recorded here, the historical setting, and we'll think about that together. And then in verses 2, the end of verse 2 and into chapter 3, we have the sphere of John's service, that is, where he was preaching. And we'll think about that. And then uh, from verses 3 onwards, 
uh, we have the substance. But verses 3 to 6, really, we have the substance of his preaching. And there are two aspects to his preaching. The first is obviously preaching, is the preaching the baptism of repentance, preaching repentance. And then there is the second aspect is preparing, preparing the way of the Lord, preparing for the coming of the Lord. And the Lord here, of course, is the Lord Jesus. And then from verses seven to nine, we have some very straight talking. See, John doesn't pull any punches in his preaching. He tells it how it is. Uh, and he brings the need for repentance to bear upon the people that come to uh, come to him. And in verses 10 to 14, we have the question of sincerity, if you like. It's a question of what is it that marks to, uh, true repentance? How do I show true repentance? And then in verses 15 to 18, we have John as a signpost. John pointing to the person of Christ. John speaking about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. And we'll find out just how much greater the Lord Jesus is than John. And how much greater the Lord Jesus is than anybody else uh, that we could think about. And so these, no, um, uh, these few sections will occupy us in the time that we have together uh, today. Remember at the end of chapter 1, uh, if, if we go back to chapter 1 and verse 80, uh, we uh, read the end of where we were dealing with John before and read about his growth and his education. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. You say, what education? Well, it was education not in the schools of men, but in the school of God. Remember, God frequently would teach his people uh, in the desert away from other people. Remember Moses. 40, day, uh, 40 years in the, uh, in the palace in Egypt, 40 years in the education system of Egypt, and then 40 years in the school of God in the desert before 40 years of leading the people of God. Well, John was in the school of God, in the deserts, in the quiet places, away from the public eye, until the day, it says the scripture, of his showing unto Israel. And now this chapter resumes John's story. This uh, it resumes, uh, resumes John's ministry. And 30 years have passed since the end of chapter one and the beginning of chapter three. And as Luke, the historian, comes into this crucial time when John's ministry starts and soon after it, the ministry of the Lord Jesus himself starts, Luke firmly anchors it. In history. The uh, historians would tell us that the date can be uh, fairly accurately established at about AD 26 or 27, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. But uh, I want you to notice the, 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 the number of the names. You know, we speak about name dropping. Uh, and we speak about um, dropping in various things. Well, Luke is doing some name dropping here. And in the space of these two verses, he gives us seven names like that, one, one after the other. And he'll speak of Tiberius and he'll speak of Pontius Pilate and he'll speak of Herod and Philip and Lysanias and Annas and Caiaphas. And these seven names he, co he comes out with in, in the space of these two verses. And he gets the names right. And he gives them their right titles. And he gets them in the right places. And it's almost, it's almost a side issue, if you like, to the, the, the writing of, of Luke. But it, it's an evidence of the, his accuracy as a historian, his confidence as, a, as, an, as an historian in the material that he has. That consistently, both through the Gospel of Luke and into the book of the Acts, he will speak about people and he will speak about jobs and titles and places. And he will do so with absolute accuracy. And it just reinforces the accuracy and the reliability of Luke's account. If you want the work of a genuine historian, 
a historian whose attention to detail is second to none. Uh, an historian who has sat down and who has established the facts and worked out the facts and spoken to the eyewitnesses, as, as he would tell us at the beginning of chapter one. We come to Luke's gospel and we can have confidence that the things that he's writing about are things that he has personally checked out uh, and the truth of which can be confirmed. But then at the end of chapter, uh, at the end of verse two, we read that the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And here we have the sphere of John's preaching, the sphere uh, of uh, John's service. Uh, in, into verse three, he came into all the country about Jordan. If we were to read in, uh, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew speaks about the wilderness of Judea. Does that not sound strange? John is coming with a message from God. You notice the word of God came unto John in verse two. He's coming from a me with a message from God. So why are you bringing it into the wilderness, into the deserts, the deserted places? It's not the, uh, the desert as we imagine the Sahara, but it, it's the places where there aren't many people naturally speaking. It's not a, a place of high population density. Why, why not bring this message to the big city, to Jerusalem or to any of the other big towns and places of Judea and Galilee of the time? Why the desert? You see, we'd think that if God is going to be speaking after 400 years of silence, if God is going to be sending out his message and preparing for the way for his son to come, I would think, well, there needs to be a big publicity campaign. And there needs to, it needs to go out on social media and we need to uh, broadly uh, um, advertise the meetings uh, and to say that John will be preaching at a certain place and a certain time on such, a, uh, such an occasion. But that's not what happens here. And in fact, you notice something else is not needed either. For when John starts preaching. And when the word of God comes and it is evident that God is speaking. Then the audience comes to John. It's interesting if we go back to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, for the most part, is confined to his house. And Ezekiel is dumb for the most part and is acting out a number of the messages that God would have uh, for the people. But you'll notice there in the book of Ezekiel that the people come to him. And here in Luke's gospel, the people come out to John. Look at it in verse seven. Then said he to the multitude, that came forth. If we were to look in um, at Matthew's Gospel uh, and chapter 3 and verse 5, we read that they came from Jerusalem and from Judea and the country round about Jordan and they flocked out to John. Why? Why? Because God was working and God was speaking. And it was clear that here was a messenger from God with God's message in his mouth. And the audience came. You know, when God works, there's no need for big publicity campaigns. And there's no need for splashing it out here, there and everywhere. When God speaks and when it is, it is known that God is speaking in a certain place, then he's capable of bringing the audience. I was reminded of the accounts that we have of the Lewis revivals. And there it was that they that the preaching would go out and the people would gather. And the people would gather to such an extent that then the preaching would go out. And the people were drawn by a thirst for the word of God and a thirst for the knowledge of God and a thirst to hear the way of salvation of God. And wouldn't we just love in these days of ours? 
to those whom God would raise up with a message from God in their mouths, would preach. But I don't know how it worked here. Was it that John was preaching and there was a few people that heard him uh, and the word spread? But as it happened, the word did spread and the multitudes came forth. Wouldn't we love in these days for halls to be packed? For people to be flocking to hear the word of God? Well, think about the message that John had. It wasn't. It wasn't an easy message. And it wasn't a comfortable message. But it was a message from God with the authority of God, nonetheless. But what about the substance of his preaching? What was his preaching about? Well, verse 3 would tell us he was preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of of sins. Now when we think of baptism here we have to realise that John's baptism is not Christian baptism. Um, Acts chapter 19 would make that uh, very clear that there were those who uh, th those believers in Ephesus who when Paul came there they had believed what John had said and they had believed the teaching of John concerning one who was coming, concerning the Messiah, the Christ who was coming, as he was pointing forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus. And they'd been baptised with John's baptism. But you'll notice there in Acts chapter 19 that they were baptised again once they heard about the Lord Jesus. And once they put faith in him, they were baptised again with Christian baptism. You see, they mean different things. And John's baptism was a, a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And if you like, the, the, the picture there was that the people would go into the water confessing their sins, as we find in other Gospels, and they would go down under the water and they would come up and it would be a picture of washing their sins away. Whereas Christian baptism, we would find in particular from Romans chapter 6, Christian baptism would speak about death and burial and resurrection and identification with the Lord Jesus in his death and burial and resurrection. Confessing that we have died with Christ and we've been buried with Christ and we've been raised again to walk in newness of life. Christian baptism isn't about the washing away of sins. Christian baptism is the demonstration of something that has already happened. See, the washing, away of, uh, the washing away of sins comes with uh, comes at conversion, at salvation. And baptism is just uh, it, 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 it is a symbol that pictures our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was preaching repentance, the need for repentance, the need for remission of sins, the need for forgiveness. And isn't that a message that's needed in our society today? A society that has, by and large, turned its back upon God. A society that, by and large, has turned its back upon the laws of God and upon the ways of God. There is a great need in our country today, in our world today, for repentance. A change of attitude, a change of heart, a change of mind. A realisation that we have gone our own way. We have turned away from God. And we have done wrong. That we have sinned. That we do need to be forgiven. But that's one aspect of John's preaching. The, the second aspect is uh, that he's preaching this baptism of repentance. But he's preparing the way of the Lord. Now, he'll do that in two ways. First of all, he's preparing the people. Remember that that was what the angel Gabriel said to uh, Zacharias, his father, in chapter 1 and verse uh, 17, where it says, He shall go before him, that's before God, in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so what John was uh, what John was doing in his preaching was he was coming and he was telling the people he was making them aware of their sin, making them aware of their need for repentance, their need for uh, forgiveness. And he was 
preparing the people, making them ready, getting them in a fit condition for the coming of the Lord Jesus. So when the Lord Jesus brought his message, a message of life, a message of hope, a message of salvation through faith in him, that the people would be prepared and ready to listen. But he was not just preparing the people, but he was pointing the people. He was pointing the people to the Lord. He was preparing the way of the Lord, telling them that the Lord was coming. And what he was doing really was he, he was like a road builder or a road mender. Uh, and he was getting ready for the, uh, for the king to come. And in those days when they were getting ready, they'd make the road straight. Uh, and they'd iron out the, uh, the, the, the crooked ways and they'd make the, 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 the road straight and they'd bring down the hills and they'd cut through the hills and they'd fill in the valleys and they'd make the rough places smooth and they'd get rid of the, uh, the, the stones out of the way. They'd make ready the pathway for the Lord and he would tell them of the coming of the king. He would tell, him, uh, he would tell them of the fact that all flesh, verse 6, shall see the salvation of God. The salvation of God is coming. Now, the salvation of God is not a, uh, a thing in, its, uh, in itself. The salvation of God is a person. Remember what Simeon said. Lord, let us now thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And the salvation of God is to be found in the person of Christ. And that's who John was pointing the people to. Obviously, as we come down the chapter into verses 16 and 17, he'll have much more to say about the coming of the Messiah, the coming uh, the, the one who is coming, and he'll tell us things about him that we'll look at at the appropriate time. <clears throat> But then from verse 7 to 9, we have some very straight talking from John, don't we? He certainly doesn't pull any punches. Says to the multitude that came forth to be baptised of him, O generation of vipers. Now that's not the way to win friends and influence people, is it? Uh, that's not the way to get people to, uh, to get people on your side comes out and looks at, the, uh, looks at the people coming, generation of vipers. You say, well, what does, that, what, what does that signify to us? Well, I'm reminded of uh, the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 as he's quoting passages from the Old Testament. Uh, and really this, this passage in the early part of Romans chapter 3 is Paul's summing up argument as he is uh, 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 as he's bringing the condemnation of the world, as he's, uh, 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 as he's bringing the evidence against the world at large so that the whole world would become guilty under judgment to God. And he's outlining the sinfulness of sin and the sinfulness of mankind. But he says in verses 13 onwards of Romans chapter 3, having said that in verse um, 12, they're all gone out of the way, they're all together, uh, they're together become unprofitable, there's none that doeth good, no, not one, and that talks about practice, but he says, their throat is an open sepulchre, an open tomb, inside is just death and deadness, with their tongues they've used deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing. And bitterness. You see, what we think of when we think about vipers in particular, isn't it, is the poison fangs that are in their mouths, the destructiveness that is in their mouths. But you know, that's where so much of our sinning lies, isn't it? It's in our mouths. It's in the death and corruption that comes out. The filthiness that comes out, the deceit, the lies, the backbiting, the gossiping, the slander, the things that we say to wound and 
destroy other people. And the cursing and the bitterness, the bad language, the blasphemy and things like that that happen. You know, James has a lot to say about the tongue in chapter three of his letter. And it's a little member, but it boasts great things. So much destruction comes through the tongue. So much deceit and hypocrisy comes from the tongue. As, pe uh, as we can say one thing and do another. And so we will speak to them as a generation of vipers, an offspring, a brood of vipers. It's interesting in the parallel passage in Matthew's Gospel, chapter three, that John addresses this, uh, this phrase and these statements on that occasion specifically to the religious people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were two of the religious sects of Judaism of the day. And these were religious people. And he calls them a generation of vipers. You see, they were marked by hypocrisy. They would say one thing and do another. They would claim to be following God and pleasing God, but actually their lives were far from it. But the Lord Jesus, too, in Matthew's Gospel, on two other occasions, he uses this expression, speaks about generation of vipers. On one occasion, it, we find it in Matthew's Gospel and chapter 12. And this is very instructive. You see there, the, the immediate context of the, this passage is that the Lord Jesus had been doing things uh, and the miracles that he'd been doing were in the power of the Holy Spirit and they were attributing the power of the Spirit of God to the power of the devil. And in verse 34 of Matthew chapter 12, he says this, he says, O generation, offspring, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now you see, that's the thing, isn't it? So often what we are on the inside, what we think about, the things that... The things that grip us, the things that grab us, the things that motivate us. These things are laid bare when we open our mouths. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speakers, the kind of people that we are. Is seen in the kind of things that we say. Now that's sobering. For as believers, what are the kind of things that we speak about? Uh, and what are the kind of things that come out of our tongues? Says the Lord Jesus, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, helpful things, things that edify and build up. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And so often we think of things that we do or don't do. And we pay little attention to things that we say. But what the Lord Jesus is saying is that actually we can't divorce the two. And what we say is very important and how we say them are very important. And what we say and how we say it shows very much what's going on within our hearts. Generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Well, the Lord Jesus again speaking in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 33. Again, speaking of the hypocrisy, particularly of the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers, he would say, "Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the judgment of hell? How can ye escape the judgment of hell? 
says John, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There is wrath that is coming. There is wrath that is coming on every individual because of their sin. On every individual that has never known the forgiveness of God and the salvation of God in, uh, in Christ. There is wrath that is coming on this world. Tribulation wrath that we read of, particularly in the book of Revelation, but we read of it in various places in the scripture. 1 Thessalonians, we read about the Lord Jesus uh, who has delivered us to wait for his son from heaven, even Jesus who delivered us from coming wrath. And that's true in a general sense that he saved us from hell, but he delivers us also from the tribulation wrath that is coming. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Do we realise if we're not saved and we're watching this uh, particular broadcast? Have we grasped the fact that there is coming wrath? Have we grasped the fact that we are not right with God, that we're needing to repent, that we're needing to be put right with God, to be made right with God? Then in verse 8 he would speak about the genuineness of repentance. He says, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. You see, repentance isn't just saying I'm sorry. I mean, I can say I'm sorry. And I can say I'm sorry for a number of reasons. I could say I'm sorry because actually that's what's expected of me. I can say I'm sorry because I want to avoid being punished for what I've done. I can say I'm sorry because someone's told me to say I'm sorry. And I'm not sorry, not one bit of it. But I'll say it anyway because that because that will keep you quiet. You see, genuine repentance is a genuine sorrow. It's a genuine attitude change. And it's accompanied by fruits that are worthy of repentance. It's accompanied by a life that is transformed, a life that goes in a different direction. See, we speak of repentance as a 180 degree turn. It's turning away from the things that we have been doing and the kind of people that we have been. And it's moving in a different path. It's moving in a different direction. Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. There needs to be a change in mind, a change in attitude, a change in life. Begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. He's speaking... Uh, he's speaking in the immediate context, he's speaking to Jews, Jews that had a rich heritage, Jews that were descended from Abraham, the father of the faithful, the one who is the first one of whom it said Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Abraham, who was called the friend of God. And they had a rich heritage and they, and they belonged to a great nation and a great family. But John's saying, don't count on that to save you. Don't count on that in the day of judgment. Don't count on the fact that you belong to the, Jew, the Jewish race. Salvation doesn't run in races. It doesn't run in countries. It doesn't run in families. If our country even yet might be called in some essence, in some sense, a Christian country, well, that doesn't make me a Christian. The fact that I fill in a form when I'm asked to declare what religion I am and say Christian, it doesn't make me a Christian. Don't begin to say within yourselves that we have Abraham to our father. That you can't rely on anything, on any accident of birth. You can't rely on any heritage and great heritage that we might have in this country. Those that laid, their, that laid down their lives to bring us the gospel and to bring us the Bible in our own language. We can't rely on that. For says John, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Because what he's saying is, he says, now the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Now here's the rub, you see. It's getting right down to the root. It's getting right to the, to the very essence. From the root of the tree and from the essence of the tree is the kind of tree that it is. An oak tree, an apple tree, a pear tree, a plum tree, whatever else it might be. It says, every tree therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit 
is hewn down and cast into the fire. See, it's the kind of tree that we are that matters. And that's actually not something that we can do anything about of our own selves. We need a change of nature. We need to be made from a tree that produces bad fruit and corrupt fruit into a tree that produces good fruit. You see, that's why repentance in itself is not enough. That's why we need Christ. That's why we have the second aspect of John's ministry. And John is just bringing the people just a further stage along the road to showing them the importance of the Christ and the, the necessity of the coming of Christ. You see, for, for, the, for the past 15, 14, 1500 years or so, they, they had the law, the Ten Commandments that God had given. And the law, says Paul in Galatians, the law was a schoolmaster. And the law was just something that was telling them and it was showing them that, well, the purpose of the law really is to show us God's standard and it can't help us keep it. It shows us God's standards and it shows us how we fall short of it and when we fall short of it and how far we fall short of God's standard. But it can't help us to keep it. It also can't make us sorry for not keeping it. And so John comes and John exposes the sin of the people and, and John brings before them the need for repentance, the need for genuine change and the need for genuine sorrow for their sin. But he can't bring about that transforming power. He can't bring about a change in life. He can't bring about that salvation. He needs to be uh, to, 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 to point them forward to the Lord Jesus. He's making them ready. He's making them in a condition to, to, to realise that they're wrong, to be sorry that they're wrong, to be ready to change. And to be looking for uh, looking forward to the uh, to the one who could bring salvation, who can bring that change. And so, having preached to them, you'll notice in verses ten to fourteen that the different people they would come and they would say, "Well, what should we do?" Verse ten, what should we do? Verse twelve, what should we do? Verse 14, what shall we do? Acts chapter 2, when Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, they come, men and brethren, what shall we do? And isn't that great? When you have people coming with a concern and their sinfulness has been exposed and their need for repentance has been exposed and they're brought to this condition where they say, what shall we do? What can we do? What can we do about it? And what is genuine repentance? Well, as we've said, genuine repentance is seen in a transformed life and he will tell, he'll show them ways in which they can demonstrate a transformed life. You'll notice that there are three groups of people. There are the, the, the people that come and then there's the tax collectors in verse 12 that come and there's the soldiers that come. And the message to each is different because, you see, we've all got different things that we need to repent of. We're all affected in different ways by sin. And there's no point if, if, my, if I've never had a problem, for example, with stealing, to repent of stealing. If I've never stolen in my life, then I've nothing to repent of. But if my mouth is foul with bad language... And I need to repent of that. And if I've been self-centred and if I've been proud and, uh, and all the different things, uh, and the Spirit of God is able to bring that to bear upon each of our, uh, each of our experiences. And let's not think that as believers there are not times that we need to repent. And that we need to put things right with God. 
And that we need to get back into communion with our God and with our Saviour when there are things that are, are not right about our lives. What should we do, they ask? You'll notice that the, in essence, self is at the centre of each of the issues that John brings before them. The people come to John in, uh, in verses 10 and 11 and say, what shall we do then? And he says, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none, and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. You see, we can be very self-centred and very self-serving and very self-absorbed. Uh, and we can be uh, happy in, uh, in looking after ourselves and keeping, uh, keeping after ourselves and not have a concern for other people. Well, consistently in the, in the New Testament, transformed lives, repentant lives are those that are outward looking, not inward looking. Those that are looking to uh, looking out to others and seeking to help others and seeking to minister to the needs of others and to, to, to serve others. And one of the marks of repentance is when someone who has been self-absorbed and self-centred becomes generous and looks out to seek to meet the needs of those around. And then the tax collectors come. Well, the tax collectors, they were a despised group of people uh, in the land of Israel at the time. They, they were those who were working for the Romans. They were working for the foreign uh, powers and they, they were collecting taxes to, to give to the Romans. And quite frequently what they did was that they would help themselves. And they would uh, <clears throat> say some for, um, uh, some for Rome and some for me. Uh, and they would either defraud Rome or they would defraud the people. They, they, they would cheat and they would swindle. They, they would maybe tell the people that they, they were due more than they were, uh, that they were due and they would give to Rome their dues and they would keep some for themselves. And you notice that in the story of Zacchaeus as we come later on in Luke's Gospel to chapter 19. He would say, if I've, if I've taken anything from anyone by wrong accusation. I restore unto him fourfold. And Zacchaeus recognised that in his own experience. And here this repentant sinner on that day to whom salvation came to, uh, to his house. That day Zacchaeus faced up to the fact that he'd not always been honest in his dealings. Now honesty is something that is <clears throat> in short supply very often. There's nothing that's, that speaks more of genuine repentance than someone who's been cheating and swindling, becoming honest and above board and just and equitable in their dealings with others. And the soldiers? Well, you see, with authority and with power comes the abuse of power, doesn't it? And the, the, the soldiers here... Evidently, what John is speaking about is tendencies that they had, well, do violence to no one. Uh, and you can imagine them going about their, their, their duties and they would be violent to those with whom they came into contact. He says, neither accuse any falsely. That's the idea of extortion. And it's the idea of protection money and all that kind of thing. You pay up and I'll look after you and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll sort you out and we'll, we'll protect you. And then being content with your wages. And all these speak to us in different ways. Uh, and they speak to different tendencies that, they were, that we would have. Contentment, you see, is, is something that's, again, in short supply, isn't it? Contentment in a materialistic society. In a society that wants you to be endlessly looking for something else and looking for something bigger and looking for something better. And these days when we can't get out to the shops in the same way. And these days when we, there's less opportunity, although there is obviously still opportunity to purchase things online, to, 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 to go out and to be, uh, look, uh, to be fostering this discontent. So John, contentment. And contentment is a mark of a Christian, isn't it? Says Paul to Timothy, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. 
See, the world looks at it the other way around. The world looks at it as gain and what I can get out of things. But Paul says godliness with contentment, being content with such things as we have, is great gain. And so then he points to Christ. Maybe briefly cover these verses just now and uh, maybe they'll be covered in slightly more detail uh, next week. But you'll notice this, they were in expectation, verse 15, and that the people were musing in their hearts concerning John, whether he was the Christ or not. And John, he doesn't make much of himself. In John's Gospel in chapter 3, he says of the Lord Jesus, he says, he must increase and I must decrease. Uh, and in John chapter 1, when they, when they say to him, what do you say of yourself? Why are you coming? He says, I'm just a voice. Uh, and the words that are quoted from Isaiah in the earlier part of this chapter, he applies to himself, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. That's all I am. I'm just a signpost. I'm just someone who's pointing the way to Christ. And that's the greatest job that any of us could have in pointing others uh, to Christ. And he, he says, I indeed baptise you with water. This is the medium that I'm baptising with. This is the, uh, the, the, the means. This is the, um, the, the method baptizing, dipping in water, says there's one who's mightier than I. Says John, I can only preach repentance. I can only, I can only tell you what you need to do. I can only point out to you your fault and the need to turn, the need to be sorry and the need to change. There's one mightier than I coming. One mightier than I coming who can bring salvation, who can bring that transforming power who can give you the, the strength and the power to live up to the things that I've been preaching. He's mightier than I. Oh, he's greater than I, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. Oh, that we might have a correct appreciation of the Lord Jesus, that we might understand something of his greatness, that we might understand something of his glory. You know, the Lord Jesus, he called John the greatest of all those born of women. And it's this man here that is speaking of the Christ that he's not worthy to do the most menial of tasks and stoop down and unloose the latchet of his shoes. I'm going to leave it there tonight. <clears throat> Just with pointing you to the person of Christ, pointing us again to the one who's mightier. He's stronger than the law. The law could only point, uh, to tell us what's right, but can't give us the power to do it. He's mightier than John. John can point out the need for repentance, the need for forgiveness. But he can't bring about that forgiveness. He can't bring about the means for forgiveness. The Lord Jesus, through his death on the cross, has vanquished, has conquered every foe. He's conquered death itself. And now he's the one who gives the power to put into practice. He's the one who changes the tree from a bad tree to a good tree. And he's the one who makes all the difference. He's our saviour. He's our Lord. Let's just pray and give thanks. Our Father, we give thanks for this time that we've had together around my word. And we give thanks, our Father, for the preaching of John. And we thank you, Father, for the, the humility that characterised him. And we thank you, Father, for the fact that, uh, that he was so aware and so conscious of what his job was and how his job was to point others to the person of Christ and to, to prepare the way of the Lord. And it was uh, the Lord's way that he was preparing and not his. And our Father, we do pray that thou would help us likewise to point others to Christ. Help us, our Father, to demonstrate in our lives the characteristics that is consistent with the profession that we make as believers in the Lord Jesus. And we pray, Father, that if there's anyone watching who doesn't know the Lord Jesus as their saviour, that they might see the, the, the seriousness of sin and the need for repentance, the, 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 the need to acknowledge and realise that their sin will keep them out of the presence of God forever unless they do something about it. Our Father, we do pray that thou transform our nation. We pray, Father, that thou bring us again to repentance. We pray, Father, that thou revive thy people. We pray that thou revive this nation. 
And we pray, Father, even that there might be a revival in this world of ours. And so we just thank thee for thy word and we pray thy blessing to be upon us as we give thee thanks. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.